All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Sean Brewster, Bodie Lennon here. Today, Bo, we're going to talk about dosage in manual therapy. This is something that's not often emphasized, I don't think, in training, undergraduate training in manual therapy. Here's how to do the technique. Here's how you apply it efficiently, effectively. We don't often talk about how much to do it. Yeah, how much is enough? How much is too much? Uh, and it can be a tricky one, certainly, you know, people respond differently to different types of stimulus and often people will have different levels of sensitivity. Uh, there's different things, you know, when we look at pain, pain is so complex and it can certainly influence um, a patient's perception and, and experience of, of manual therapy. So um, we need to take this in, in, in uh, keep this into consideration, but um, there's often no hard rules and that's why we don't often like protocols, right? Because you can't say to someone that you have to do this amount of a certain technique for this ex period of time um, because it just doesn't work that way. No, that's right. And I was teaching a course on the weekend and somebody said, how many repetitions of this should I do or how, how many minutes should I apply it for? And I think my advice to them was, you know, if, if anybody ever teaches you something and says you should do it for exactly three minutes or exactly 20 repetitions or exactly, you can pretty much just stop listening at that point because it is a protocol that is based on nothing to do with the patient at that point. You know, if, if, if we are to consider the patient as the central point of, it, of our decision-making, we have to think about the person first. Like you said before, the level of sensitivity that they're experiencing at that time, how long they've been experiencing the symptoms for, um, is it acute or a chronic presentation? How do they typically respond to these sort of ap applications? All of these individual factors that go into helping us make these clinically reasoned decisions have to be considered before we can say, I would apply it for this long, or I would do it this many times, or, or I would do it on this particular day even. Uh, and so dosage is such an individual decision, isn't it? Yeah, and, you know, you'll see that the good clinicians out there, they're um, having that constant communication with a patient. Um, you can't just, you know, let's say put a needle in and then pull it out because you think it's ready. What are they noticing? What are they experiencing during that time? Is there any change in symptoms? Um, and getting them to describe that and having that constant interaction, and that's really involving and engaging the, the, the patient in the treatment, and that's how we can get far better responses. Definitely, yeah. Well, someone asked me the other day, and this is great, it's like, a really a clear example is dry needling, right, where you can say I could use a very stimulatory approach where I use a lot of pecking or pistoning or I can leave the, t the needle in, in, t in situ in the tissue where it just sort of stays still and there's every kind of variation between that. And that's a classic example of dosage and the amount of stimulation to you apply to the patient dramatically alters the outcome for the person. And so this person was saying, I, I saw this particular therapist uh, and they always put the needle in a few short, sharp stimulations, the needle's out and they move on to the next thing. Is that right or is this other approach right? And I said, well, yes. <laughs> like For the right patient in the right situation, it might be appropriate, but there's a whole lot of patients out there where that's just the wrong thing to do for them um, based on their particular situation. So we can't say that one particular style of, of, of uh, application is right because it does depend on the patient. Yeah, exactly. I've... I've uh heard people talking about, oh, this is what I do for my sciatica patients. What do you mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you do the same thing for someone that presents with uh, these symptoms, right? Um, it's so variable. And the, the importance of assessing, treating, reassessing, reevaluating, and then, you know, going from there, it's, it's, always going to be that little bit different. We can't look at two people exactly the same. People are so different. Their subjective experience of pain is different. Mm -hmm. So we can't apply the same treatment intervention to everyone and expect the same thing to work. Um, again, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's, unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated than that. That's right. And anyone who's watching or listening to this and, and looking at the title and going dosage and manual therapy, oh, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to these guys and they're going to tell me how many times I should do it and what I should do. The answer is unfortunately very grey, isn't it? All these different factors that we're talking about go into our decision-making process. And so to really be able to decide above and beyond just to understand the patient with what's going on with them, we have to understand the mechanisms at play in the, in the, the modalities that we use. 
And so much of what we do in manual therapy happens as a result of sensory input to the body. I'd say the majority of the mechanisms at play that we produce outcomes from are purely just sensory input. And then that can happen with a needle. It can happen with our hand. It can happen with tape. It can happen with joint glides. It can happen with all these different things, mechanosensory input, different types of sensory input to the body. And so when you look at different dosages, really what we're looking at is different amounts of sensory input. And then we can get more specific about which types of mechanosensors, which types of nerve endings are we stimulating to produce these outcomes. So to be even before we consider the patient and their individual situation, we have to consider the, the modality we're using and the mechanisms at play and understanding those. So there's different layers of understanding. It's the human and there's also the application. Do we understand the tool? Do we understand the outcomes that that tool can produce in the different contexts that we can apply? So it's, it's un there's unfortunately no simple answer to this. Is you just have to really know your stuff. Yeah, and, you know, we were talking about uh, updating our, our joint therapeutics course and, you know, questioning things that, that we've sort of, you know, if there's a one set of 10 reps, well, how come? Yep. Why are we choosing that? Could you do one set of six? Could you do three sets of four? You know, so it, it really does depend. And, it and you know, when we look at it that way, well, how sensitive or how irritable is the person? If they're highly irritable, do less. If they're less irritable, you could probably do more. Um, but at the same time, you do, do a bit, stop, reassess, constantly check in with the patient, and then you can do a little bit more, see what their response is, see what their response is the following day, and having that constant communication because, you know, some people will just respond differently. And, and even those ones that you think you can apply a higher dosage of treatment, sometimes they will have a bit more of a, a stronger response to that treatment. You think, oh, actually, I didn't quite expect that. Um, but that's okay. That Obviously, again, different people, um, different responses, and we just need to modify our dosage based on that response. Um, but yeah, have putting categorizing people into certain um categories of um this is how you would respond to this type of intervention um yeah it's a tricky one it's flawed yeah and you mentioned before about us updating courses that's something we regularly do is we audit the courses and audit our thinking around the courses and this is a, a valuable exercise and i know that we we just put ourselves recently looking at different types of dosage and the, that dosage was based on some old ideas that we've been taught and we, we continue to use and so we're preaching this, but at the same time, we all need to reflect on what we're doing and what were we taught at school? Did our teachers say, this is how you do it? And if, and if so, we ha have to audit ourselves and our, and our understanding of those things. Like, does that hold water? May like, maybe it did at the time. Maybe the research at the time suggested that that was the appropriate way to do it. But what does the research say now? Has it changed? And then our clinical reasoning based on our experience and the research and our patient's experiences all combined has that altered our understanding of what, what what else might be possible as opposed to what we've been doing previously? Exactly, because there's more mechanisms at play. I know you mentioned, you know, bottom up, like changing sensory input. We've got top down. We've got what is their experiences and expectations and um, their their internal model and the, the predictions they make about any sensory input. Um, so there's a lot of different things at play. Plus, you know, you add in all the, the psychosocial factors um, and all of that, how that comes together is the, the sort of the construct of a patient's pain experience. Um, so, yeah, if, if we think about it that way, right, someone may have, um, if it's a, if it's a bottom up problem, if it's a, if it's an input problem or a perception issue, then you could potentially change their perception, change that input. But, you know, when there's other things that are going on as far as, you know, it could be psychosocial uh, um, contributors trying to do a sensory input change may not be the best approach. It, it's, it may not be the best tool for that It'll particular only get you so person. Far. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, if we were to try to use this, this conversation as a teaching exercise for people, when we'd say, what are the key things to consider? Well, there's a lot, there's a lot to consider. And so this is why you see a practitioner who's been at, at their game for you know decades, they can kind of do all of that in real time and then come up with an appropriate decision uh, or an appropriate decision uh, towards their, their treatment plan. Um, but it's actually quite difficult to teach 
And it's very difficult, difficult to learn. I think it, it, a lot of it comes through experience. And if I'd say, let's focus on one thing, it would be reflection. And so after each patient consultation, sit back and go, okay, how did that go? What sort of response did I get? Not just from the physical treatment, but what are some of the things that I may have missed? What questions could I have asked them about their personal uh, experience at that point in time with their life, with their work, with their family, with their stresses, their sleep, their diet, all of these things? Could those things have contributed to the outcome of my treatment? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. Which questions did I miss? Let's reflect on that. Let's also reflect on what could I do differently if I was to address those things in the dosage that I'm choosing for this particular application. Has, is, let's give a, cl a, a clinical example. So the patient presents with uh, neck pain, but they've also slept really poorly for the last week. There's stress at work. Um, they hint that there's a bit of, um, you know, a bit of arguing going on at home. Um, they're, they're getting headaches as well. Okay, so we've got a highly stressed, highly sensitized person with a, an emotional overlay, psychological overlay with all of that. And we treated somebody with the same physical problems last week, but without these other things. And we did seven reps of this particular application, they've responded perfectly. You can't expect to get the same thing with that person. So maybe the approach is more subtle, maybe this is less direct, maybe more indirect approaches. And then after a session or two, we can get to more of the mechanical, more of the, the, the physical approaches. So it's, you have to consider each individual and all these factors before we can make any decisions about how to apply the application. Yeah, for sure. And even I like to uh, sort of, um, well, liken dosage to, to exercise. Yep. So you think about that in the same context as manual therapy, but, you know, you could do too much dosage to a pace, patient in, the, in a first session, right? Mm. Like you could give them all sorts of manual therapy, mobilizations, deep tissue massage, cupping, needling, e-stim, ISTM, whatever you choose, like just throw everything at them. That would be the same as first session at the gym, yep. just going and doing squats, deadlifts, lunges, you know, box step ups, you know, all of this <laughs> stuff, four sets of 10 of all of this. And yeah, good luck walking for the next two weeks. That's right. right? That's, yeah. It's a high dosage Um so there could be an adverse effect from that. However, you could get the dosage right by applying the appropriate amount in that first session, seeing how they respond, and then progressively increasing from there. So, yeah, get, getting that right is important. And it, but even, you know, um, often less can be more. Mm -hmm. um, not more is more and, and try to bombard them. Um, so it's that that gradual progressive approach and, and seeing their response because people will respond. Some will go, that was fantastic. Absolutely love that. Need more of that. Others will be like, wow, I was really sore. I, I was really sore for the next three or four days. That's probably not a really good response. Um, you know, ideally a patient should walk away feeling better that they can then engage in in exercise and activities that they haven't been able to like when we look at the the effect of manual therapy fantastic to modulate someone's pain um, for a period of time to allow them to be more active if we're uh, if an intervention is making them worse for a period of days then that's probably a bit too much yeah yeah absolutely um, and I, I like your your example there about you know more is better. It's it's just so true, and we see this quite a lot of practitioners that they have so many tools in the toolkit, they just want to use them all on the patient. It's almost like a demonstration of of their ability in every session, and really that's not what it's about. We often talk about the Arndt Schultz law. You know, this uh, tissue will respond to an appropriate amount of stimulus to a point where where it sort of maxes out and that's the maximum physiological benefit that you can get from that particular application and you can see this in everything that we do if you get that right if you nail that with the patient they walk away like you said feeling fantastic there's no post-treatment soreness there's no there's there's not really a period of of, uh, of of like a downside to the treatment afterwards before they can then start feeling better again it's i walked out feeling great i stayed feeling great for however long that might last but the problem with the Arndt Schultz law is to get to the top of that hill and stop is quite difficult, like without going down the other side. And when you come down the other side, the other side of that slope is steeper and it drops down lower than where you started. And so for the practitioners who are, are using, like you said, needling, cupping, taping, mobbing, IASTM, 
um, and massage and a bunch of other things, heat, whatever, all in the one session, it's so difficult to measure effect because there's so much sensory input being applied and so little ability to be able to measure the outcome of that in that one session that you'll hit the top of that peak, shoot straight off the other side and crash into a wall without even realizing. And so I think the solution to help us get the dosage right and to, to maintain that maximum beneficial effect is to do something and then immediately assess the outcome. Do another thing or even the same thing, immediately assess the outcome. Keep doing that until your outcome starts to plateau or it starts to dip and then you stop. Right? That's assess, treat, reassess. And then, like you said before, reevaluate. Do I need more of this or do I, do I cease at this point? The hardest challenge, I guess, for the person who works in blocks of time, half hours, 45 minutes or an hour, is the patient might pay for an hour. You do what you're going to do. You nail it in 20 minutes. Then you've got 40 minutes to tap dance. So what do you do with that? And so this might, to be able to do this really well, to get dosage really, to, to get it right, either we get better at what happens after the manual therapy to reinforce, so the education, providing information, providing positive feedback, guidance, that kind of stuff, and use the time more efficiently there. Or we, ch we change to a different paradigm of treatment. So where people don't pay for a block of time, they pay for a solution. We allocate time for that solution to occur. It may happen faster. I guess like you would see a doctor, you pay for a consult. If they've got you in and out the door in two minutes and the job's done, well, then the job's done. You're, getting, you're paying the same amount regardless. Um, and so it might require a paradigm shift, but I think maybe a combination of the two. Here's your block of time. If I'm really good, I'll do it faster. Plus, here's the block of time. A section of that is for treatment. The rest of it is where we're going to do the long-term planning, actually give you some skills to manage this yourself. And I think that's where a lot of manual therapists falls down. They think that they have to have their hands on their body the whole time when realistically it's just part of, of what, them, what they can do for the patient. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that is it, right? When shifting that perception from they're paying for me to put my hands on their body, well, no, they're paying for your time. And your time in, could include manual therapy it certainly includes education advice exercise mobility whatever that may be so although the the physical component of the treatment could be done in 20 minutes yeah that the rest of that being education and and uh, you know showing them how to to do this themselves and manage their own symptoms and addressing other factors that is really what's important it's not about you having your, your hands on on the patient the whole time because what you do is valuable not only with your hands but the the level of knowledge and understanding and experience and all of that sort of stuff that really really comes into it because at the end of the day you're helping them as an overall package not just pressing spots on their body absolutely and that that is the advice we want to get across to all of the clinicians right the people that might be listening to this they, they consider themselves a clinician now if you're a technician and for that category i would say people like massage therapists or, or health practitioners who provide a nice sensory input to give the patient a nice experience a, a relaxing experience a therapeutic kind of experience think of all your massage therapists who, the patient clientele people coming through the door are people that come there to feel good now that's not what we're talking about here right that's that's a different situation that's nice, pleasant sensory input to make to take the patient somewhere physically and uh, mentally somewhere else for a period of time. And there's benefit in that, absolutely. Stress management, you know, and even in pain management as well, there's a huge amount of benefit to that. But what we're talking about here in, for dosage is for the clinician who is dealing with a, a solution for a problem, trying to aim for a solution. Uh, and that's, we have to draw that line in the sand, I think, because some people might be listening to this going, but hang on a second. My patients come to see me, they want me hands-on 55 minutes and they float out the door. Okay, fantastic. That's a different business model. It's a different set of clients. Um, I guess what we're talking about here is the a patient with a problem that needs a solution as soon as possible. Yeah, I came in with, uh, you know, I hurt my shoulder yep. two months ago and I'm struggling now to pull my pants up. Can you yep. help? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Yeah. Look, but I reckon um, there's there's so much in this topic and it, the unfortunate point of it is, like I said before, there's no 
here's the five steps to make sure you get your dosage right. Um, you identified some really key things around the, the whole person before. If, if someone's watching or listening this, that's the bit to take away, like, okay, what are the things I need to consider? The other side of that is what are my, my what are the physiological effects of my modality that I'm choosing to use? You pair those two things together, you get the right match, you get the best outcome for the patient. And then the dosage is obvious at that point. I need to use this technique in this way for this patient because of their individual circumstances and situation on that particular day. It becomes very obvious, but you can't do that unless you understand both sides of that coin. Yeah, well said. Cool. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much, both. Thanks, everyone, for listening, watching. Catch you next time. Cheers.